Um, moving on to behavioural economics then, I imagine there's quite a lot of variation here. Um, it's a much bigger topic in AQA, um, but it appears much earlier in Edexcel. I don't think, I was looking at Educast today because I don't like AQA at all. <laughs> I was looking at the, I was looking at the, at the Educast um, spec, and I couldn't see it anywhere on there, but I thought it was part of the new reforms, it was like a necessity that it came in, but, um, I say new reforms, it's been like five years. Um, so, first of all, where where do we teach behavioural economics? Where does it come within our scheme of work? And I don't, mean, don't necessarily mean in the calendar, I mean, where does it come in the flow of our work? Well, for me, it, I, I do it as a sort of thing in the summer after the, the most of the first year. So the first year is pretty much straightforward, classical, um, market blah 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 and then introduce these uh you know other issues later other then basically um as opposed to as you say uh, edxl sort of seems to imply they want it sort of earlier now it's obviously up to you whether you do that but it, mm. it's sort of like you go straight into the rational choice debate stuff fairly early sort of and i don't like that i, I just i, I want to because also again it sort of tells a story back back to previous issue of uh of rooting all the sort of theory in its place and you can sort of do a thing of right we've done the sort of core bit of economics up to like march or something and now let's look at some more interesting things how things have developed what things are what like a bit more now and uh, do it that way i think it's very easy with behavioral economics to for it to become an add-on and mm. for students not to properly understand the place of, of behavioural economics within economic thought. And that's a real problem because it's almost like we've told them all this stuff and then we're like, well, but actually that's not true because the main assumption that we've got doesn't work. And I think that's a, that's a kind of a, a bit of a fundamental issue. And I, I don't think that doing it early or doing it late gets around that problem. Um, because if you do it late, it's almost like, oh, but none of that's true. And if you do it early, it's like, hey, but nothing else we're about to tell you is actually true. And, you, and because particularly in edX, it isn't covered in very much detail, it feels very much like an add-on. Um, and it's quite difficult when you, to integrate that. Um, so uh, Gavin says, I always try one of those experiments that start the topic and halfway through the topic. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great things you can do with them. Um, so what experiments do you do? So, such as the length of the line, tell five kids what to say, and then see if the sixth and seventh will say the same. Um, do one with eight times seven times six times five. five yeah, so eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one versus one times two times three times four times five. five. I, I, can, I can count, I, honestly. I've got... I was a maths teacher. So, so, so what's that? Then? That people will guess it, it, unless if, they know their unless they know their factorials off by heart. They guess a higher answer when you start. Higher answer for the eight times the seven state. than okay. the one times two. Yeah. Interesting. And um, and then you teach. And then the, the line one is their confederates in the uh, in the <laughs> experiment saying A is bigger than B, and then does the Patsy pick the right one or the wrong one? Yeah. Okay. So you find you but you find that the experiments always fail. When you say do you mean they fail, do you mean that people fail to be rational or, or they fail to make the point that people aren't rational? The kids don't do what they should they don't do what they should do. As in as in they it turns out that they are rational and it ruins the experiment. Um so it, if you do follow the spec, it comes quite early. And I quite like the fact that we talk about it next to, um, that, that it comes quite close to, this is what rationality is, however, we're probably not rational. What I don't think the Edexcel spec does very well is almost resolve that issue and say that actually it's still worth us continuing with the rational assumptions for all of these reasons. Um, I like giving, yeah, depth is an issue in Edexcel in general, but, um, um, but, um, I like giving them a, a summary. I don't. I know that we're anti-summary. Um, I like giving them a summary of the Dan Ariely book. I can't remember which one, um, because I think that does quite well. It was almost it helps students understand the place of of. Yeah, in fact, he's the, he's the first thing I show them in, in this. That I have this sort of like summer term interesting stuff three week period that I've done before and uh, 
uh, it's actually using quite a lot of videos and things, but with questions dropped around them and, and so on. And that's the first thing I show is a Dan Ariely video from, you know, way back in the heyday of so 2008 or something. Um, and uh, yeah, TED Talk, for basically really introduction one to predictably irrational, goes through a load of the sort of classic experiments. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting introduction, I think, uh, to what's going on. But then you, you touched upon something there as well as well. And it's about going back to the, the rationality stuff that my feelings on the whole topic have changed quite a lot since then. And um, I sort of feel like we added it, you know, the example sort of added it in too rashly and quickly in a way, because, I agree. you know, things have soured on it a little bit back. I was, I was all over it back when predictory rational and nudge came out and um, reading those on the beach and stuff. And it was great. And now, 12 13 years on or whatever things are a bit sort of more nuanced and it's not entirely clear what we should be telling the students really um so i'm, I'm a bit a little bit sort of agnostic about what to do with it i think i i feel quite similarly about nudges versus what's just a what's a regulation or what's you know but no about seeing nudges as something separate from market intervention um i think some some resources and some um books and stuff see it as a very very separate issue when i wonder whether it whether we need to make that separation of what is a nudge versus what is just an intervention um, yeah. whether we whether, or maybe it's just that i don't properly understand the difference i mean my understanding is that a nudge is an intervention based on the fact that we're not rational but i, I don't know whether that's actually well the, 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 the libertarian paternalism thing would say that it, we haven't taken away anyone's choice exactly yeah so we're regulation not, we're not might, might say we yeah. just, but we've just changed that yeah um there was a obviously of course it's now been quite topical in the last six to eight months or whatever that there was a lot of chat about behavioral science most some of it rubbish uh over covid and yeah so there was um Amongst other things, there was a great edition of uh, analysis and, on Radio 4 in the last series that was about behavioural science and the pandemic and um, uh, about the fact, yeah, we didn't really know much at all, but it got a lot of coverage. So there's a lot to talk about and, and to pick up on in the last year. I like there was a panel discussion from LSC as well, uh, from behavioural scientists, but also but interesting, behavioural scientists from a lot of spheres. So yes, oh, I, I think I know exactly the one you mean, yes. Um, there was kind of an economist and a data scientist and a psychologist, behavioural scientist, because actually behavior, behavioural economics has a lot of crossover in lots and lots of different spheres. And that's, that can be quite interesting, that they have this, they have this common, common um, area of study, but very, very different lenses through which they're studying it. Um, and that's an, that's another interesting one. Um, what what do students find difficult, or what are the common misconceptions that we find with with behavioural? I think so. What you what you alluded to a little bit earlier about the, the sort of degree to which they need to know some specific things, some specific biases, how they might then use them in an exam question. I think it is quite tough to integrate it all together. Um, I think although you say the, the AQA has got more in it, the questions they've asked so far have been fairly accessible because they've been sort of, you know, what could bring a, bring a little bit of behavioural economics in as a contrast to sort of standard um, approaches. And that's been very doable, I think. There was a really good question a few years ago about... I think, but then I think you have to be quite mindful about integrating it into, into the wider scheme of yeah. work. And yeah, exactly. being a theme rather than a, a topic. Yeah. So Manisha, you're saying that, that students don't even take notice. Go on. I'm really, really struggling with, with my kids at the minute actually paying any attention to anything that isn't on the screen in front of them. Oh, really? They just have no kind of... Yeah, so... <laughs> psychology at all, or, or how minds work and things like that. Yeah, so even talking... They go to, they go to Morrison's every lunchtime to get something or other but they don't pay attention to what's actually in front of them like if i ask, yeah and because they're constantly like glued to their phones <laughs> so i think it's getting them away from like actually paying attention to what's going on in the world <laughs> oh you could use it you could use the phones and talk about you know the gamification and the reward system <laughs> yeah, and how, oh, and that's interesting that's <laughs> And um, uh, the thing that I find the most difficult, and it, again, I've kind of alluded to it before, is, is 
they understand they understand it they find it interesting but they don't know how to connect it together to the rest of what they've learned it's i think they all see it as this add-on and that probably comes from how i've taught it um but I think that's something that, that needs to that needs some thought um, is that they, they do just struggle to, to see the place of it um, and they can't see so either they don't they don't realize that actually if the assumption of rationality doesn't hold that that has colossal effects for the rest of economics but that might be because I've generally taught it quite early and they don't really know what the you know they don't know what the rest of economics is so they they you know it's not like the world's been taken out from under their feet certainly um, so either they don't recognize that it's really that it's the impact of of rationality not holding or they then can't see the point in learning anything else um so again i think the dan Ariel stuff helps with that i think because it help, does help to marry those two things together and seeing that that the economic research still continues it's not like we just found out one day that people weren't rational um, that there needs to be some kind of marrying of the two. Um, but that, again, I think that's going to take a lot of work on my part, being very deliberate. I don't know if anyone has any kind of tips as to how you do that. Um, Only to, again, go back a step a little bit to the thing we said before about, sort of, again, rooting it in its sort of place, that, um, you know, where, where has this come from? You could even put it in a sort of almost like a, almost a political context almost mm -hmm. of, of it really, it started to really grow in the 80s ish uh, when it sort of started and then it, of course it really made it sort of public impact in 2000s and we're back into a sort of situation of maybe center left liking the market after all but sort of maybe wanting to nudge things in different ways and, and so I, I like to root it in that sort of area of the the libertarian versus interventionist sort of debate yeah, is, yeah. It, is it a sort of third way thing uh that we but then of course you get into the debate about well that's again probably economist hubris still someone's designing these things and uh like what's going yeah. on so, you know, we're, we're still, people still have a choice when there's when there's a tax people still are making yeah. their own choices we're just changing the we're changing the parameters a bit i wonder if it might be worth i the more and more i think about it the, the more I found that history of economic thought has helped, you know, knowing more about history of economic thought has helped my understanding. Thanks, Gavin, for that. Um, that I wonder whether it would be worth doing a bit of almost having a separate, almost like a course at some point, like a, a block at some point where we kind of look at that. And it's, but it's where you would do that. Um, there, was a, there was a good text, I think it's a uni textbook, um, but the first few pages were kind of a broad history of economic thought and it kind of took you through lots of different bits. But because it was at the start of the textbook, it didn't require any specific knowledge. And actually there was a, someone posted the, because the, the first chapter is a sample chapter. So actually you can access it for free as well, which is pretty useful. Um, the kids really, the kids really, when you say they really like it, do you mean they really like history of thought or the kids really like behavioral i i agree and i i think it's i, I enjoy teaching it but i'm just not mm. really good enough where do, where do you guys find your resources for it what how do you decide which gains to look at and which nudges to look at there's so many of them i find it really difficult i know that that, that, that it has potential to be a great series of lessons but i don't really ever feel like i've accomplished it No, <laughs> no, no. I don't know. Yeah, neither do I really. I, I, I based my initial materials a few years ago on the, um, on actually the, uh, because it was a new thing. The there's an AQA teacher resource which basically goes through the um, uh, all the things they need to the teachers need to know. I basically sort of gave them that with so, a few yeah, more yeah. a few more questions and annotations and uh, additional bits for me and, and and we used that as our almost like our textbook. Um, but that was sort of like a thing I did and I haven't really revisited it. And I, yeah, I, I, as I say, I feel, I feel like I'm not quite doing it right. Uh, and right to the behavioral insights. <laughs> <laughs> right to the behavioral insights. So right to the nudge unit um, and kind of a two to two thing. I, I've used a, um, there's quite a good uh, infographic that just has lots of nudges with like, it's got like 30, 30, 
no, 30 biases that we have, um, which is quite good at just going through lots. Um, the uh, Games Economists play, has anyone ever been on that website? The Games Economists, there's some, there yeah. are some on there. It's quite difficult to find the ones that you actually want, but in general, that, that can be quite a, quite a nice place to look. Um, also, I think a lot of the American resources are quite good because, because in general, a lot of US high schools can design their own courses. And so a lot of them do tend to err uh, towards, and actually I found that a lot of the more American courses err uh, towards engagement rather than necessarily, I don't know, curriculum like we do. Um, but actually in this instance, it can be quite useful because a lot of, there's a lot of crossover there. Um, any other bits and pieces? All right, perfect timing, it's literally just turned seven. Has anyone got any other questions, queries, notices? No? Everyone seems so much more tired than they did in the September <laughs> one. <laughs> Everyone's a bit like, come on. Um, I feel that we've got, what's it called, fifth week blues. Does anyone, fifth yeah. week blues? Oh, Gavin just made an interesting point there. Yeah, the, the interesting comes in micro, but it's a classic micro macro thing for yeah. me. Yeah, because you, you can always tell that story of like, well, you know, Keynes was talking about animal spirits, blah, 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 and, and things which are not quite about rationality and there's, you know, Keynesian beauty contest and so on. And yes, yeah, so there's all there's all these things which overlap. So again, there's lots of choice, I suppose. Yeah, lots of, lots of choice, but sometimes with, when, well, and you've got lots of choice. I think that's the, <laughs> hit the nail on the head with this. When there's lots of choice. <laughs> there we um, go, another, another classic like study. This, there's, there's so many options that actually it makes it much harder to pin yourself it's down. The, and it's, the, it's the jam in the thing. supermarket study, another thing. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah. Like I, I know there's a brilliant lesson sequence out there, but there's just so much of it but I just haven't found one. So if anyone teaches behavior really well this year, send me a power. I'll let, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs>